Hello. Good morning. My name is Jacob Bonney, and I will be your MC this morning as we embark on a wonderful journey of leadership with all sorts of fun activities. On behalf of the LEP class, uh, I'm very excited to welcome you to our Leadership Institute titled One Community Collective Impact. We've got some fantastic speakers for you this morning, some engaging activities, and plenty of time to share with the folks at your table and learn a little bit from one another about how we can make a great impact in the Central Florida and at UCF. As we get started this morning, we would be remiss if we did not take a moment to remember Dr. Valerie King. Dr. King was the founding director of the Office of Diversity Initiatives and of the LEP program. She passed away in February. Dr. King designed the LEP program and led it every year for nearly two decades. Please join us in a moment of silence this morning to recognize Dr. King for her many contributions to the Office of Diversity and Inclusion, UCF, and the Central Florida community. Thank you. As we begin, th begin this morning, I have a few housekeeping items to share with you. This is an excellent time to silence your cell phones uh, and spend this morning together working uh, to learn a little bit from each other. Feel free to tweet out all of the great, wonderful knowledge. Other than that, cell phones, let's silence those. That'll be great. Uh, we're really excited to welcome our live stream participants out there on the UCF YouTube page. Uh, so please be mindful if you're attending here physically. Uh, we will be recording, and uh, as we are progressing throughout the morning, there are cameras in the back. Uh, so if you do need to step up and get more coffee or uh, use the restroom or anything like that, feel free, but uh, please try to avoid lingering in the back in front of our cameras. As time permits this morning, we are going to ask lots of questions of our panelists and our keynote speaker. So please start thinking about those and be prepared to ask some great, wonderful, insightful questions this morning. All right, I'm going to transition to Sylvia, and she's going to tell you a little bit more about the UCF Collective Impact. Good morning, and thank you for coming. My name is Sylvia Polito, and I am honored to be an LEP scholar this year and be a part of this amazing and intelligent and motivated group of individuals. Um, I'm here to tell you a little bit about our, um, our focus on this year's um, in LEP Institute. When we got together, we wanted to um, focus on the idea of community and the UCF strategic plan and how diversity and inclusion specifically are a part of that. So I'm just going to read through some of the, um, the, the main topics of the UCF collective impact, and then this will be discussed in more detail, obviously, by our keynote speaker. So UCF's collective impact. It says, we use the power of scale and the pursuit of excellence to better solve tomorrow's greatest challenges. And some of those greatest challenges, of course, are how to make this a community of, that includes everyone. And to make a better future for our students and society. Through learning, discovery, and partnerships, we transform lives and livelihoods. UCF is in the unique position, since it is such a large um, university, to combine scale together with excellence to create an impact, a collective impact, on the Central Florida community and also the global community. Our promise. This is um, UCF's promise to us. but. As I mentioned before, a promise is uh, part of what has been awesome this year has been to learn about the topics of diversity and inclusion, to learn how to discuss these sensitive topics because it's a, it's a conversation that not everybody wants to have a lot of times. Um, so that's part of what I have taken away from the LEP Institute, from the LEP um, Scholar Program this year. UCF's collective impact wants to harness the power of scale to transform lives and livelihoods. In the end, we want to make a difference. 
They want to attract and cultivate exceptional and diverse faculty, students, and staff whose collective contributions strengthen us. Diversity is strength. Deploy our distinctive assets to solve society's greatest challenges. Create partnerships at every level that amplify our academic, economic, social, and cultural impact and reputation. Innovate academic, operational, and financial models to transform higher education. So we have the opportunity within this um, institute today to brainstorm ways that we can use these, um, this time and these topics to find a way to, ha to help UCF meet the objectives in their um, strategic plan. Thank you, and now I will introduce Anita, who's gonna um, talk about a fun activity that we have coming up. Good morning. Sorry, I'm going to lower this a little bit. We are so happy that you chose this morning to share with us. You're going to be uh, very pleased. We have some great speakers, great activities. So um, before we bring up our wonderful keynote speaker, Dr. Jones, we're going to do a little activity at the table. Um, each of you have some strips of paper, color paper, at your desk. And based on what Sylvia talked to us about with the, um, the collective impact, what we'd like you to do is think about, as individuals, what you can do to impact UCF, Central Florida, and write that on your strip of paper, okay? So you can talk among yourselves or just go ahead and write that down. We also have LEP scholars and mentors strategically around the room. If you guys could raise your hand, the LEP scholars and mentors. So if you get stuck and you need some help, just holler at one of them and they'll come over and help you. So I will give you a few minutes to write some things and on your paper and then we'll come back.
since we're going to do something with your strips of paper, you can put one idea per, so the more you use, um, the better. So we're going to make a paper chain with them. So if you are done with your ideas, take your time. you still got plenty of time. But at, we provided you with tape. So at your table and collectively, uh, work with your group to make one table chain. I see we've got some great chains going on here. This is excellent. <laughs> I hear a lot of nice conversation going on, too. That's excellent. You can also use this time to go replenish your coffee or refreshments as well. <laughs> Oh, I don't know. Oh, okay. Good. Okay. Yes. Yes. Yeah, she said she was just 
going to take one with her, and I, I didn't even think about it being contraband. All right, if we can be wrapping up just a minute. Did everybody put together their chain? Let's, no? All right, everybody good? Let's hold it up. Everybody hold it. Someone at the table, a couple people, hold your chain up. Let's, let's get a visual of how we, wow. I'm, I'm thinking these two tables have won here. That's great, and this table over here, this is excellent. Um, the exercise, thank you so much for taking the time to think about how you can impact your surroundings. And as I said, we will do this as a post. Uh, so we'll return to this and give you an opportunity as you hear our guest speakers. Um, if there's other ideas or things you think about as they are speaking, we'll come back to it. Um, is there anybody at the table that would like to share maybe something that they have uh, put on their chain? All right, over here. Wonderful. You guys have a great chain over there. That's awesome. local area to help build the community and strengthen its bond with UCF. Help bring outside diversity assets, partnered with university departments for staff support, Partnership, create partnership, impacting the economy of UCF. Oh, the other way. To help the university become a better place in, be replace. Help the university become a better place in students, I guess. Oh, it's not the other way. Collective impact supports collaborative and data analysis of staff, diversity, recruitment. Support selection and integration of a cloud-based talent acquisition. Very good. Thank you very much. That was excellent. Those are great ideas. Anybody else want to share? All right. Well, like I said, please leave that on your table, and we will give you some time later to add to it. And thank you so much. I am going to turn this over to Shamika, who will be uh, introducing our keynote speaker, Dr. Jones.
Thank you, Anita. Good morning. My name is Shamika Day, and I, it is my distinct pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker for this, year, this year's event. Dr. Lisa Jones has over 23 years of experience in higher education and currently serves as Associate Provost for Strategy and Special Assistant to the President and as a Professor of Higher Education here at the University of Central Florida. She was tenured and promoted at two top institutions prior to joining UCF, and her distinguished record of scholarship in her field earned her induction into the International Adult and Continuing Education Hall of Fame in 2012. Throughout her career in higher education, she has led highly productive college level, statewide, and national team strategic planning initiatives through her results driven and outcome focused approach that leads to measurable impacts for organizations. Today, Dr. Jones facilitates and leads efforts to institutionalize UCF's collective impact strategic plan and also leads efforts to strengthen community engagement at UCF. As you will see, Dr. Jones is truly committed to the university's goals and direction and has the drive and ambition needed to help us reach the next level. Please join me in welcoming our One Community Collective Impact keynote speaker, Dr. Lisa Jones. Good morning, everyone. We can do just a little bit better than that, right? This is going to be a long 45 minutes if I can't get <laughs> a little more participation than that. So good morning, everyone. Good morning. First and foremost, I want to thank uh, Shamika Day for the wonderful introduction. And I want to thank all of the LEP 2017 cohort for the invitation to speak today. Um, I would also be remiss if I didn't thank the Office of Diversity and Inclusion, all of the leadership, and that whole team who put this wonderful LEP program together and has kept it going through the years to provide such a significant opportunity. What an opportunity to learn about leadership and to participate in seminars and to engage with colleagues and leaders across campus. But one of the most important aspects of that program, to me at least, is the mentoring component. If you look at higher education literature, right, and you look at why many persons of color um, in any underrepresented group, women in non-traditional fields, why they don't excel to higher levels and senior levels of, of leadership in higher education, oftentimes is due to lack of mentoring and lack of coaching. So the foresight to really put that component and solidly in the LEP program um, is extraordinary. And I'm deeply, deeply honored to be uh, the keynote speaker for this institute. So let's see what we're going to do in the time that we have together today. So I want to do a very quick overview of collective impact, building upon the theme, one community collective impact. It won't be a deep dive at all. It'll just focus on what I feel is the essence of our collective impact strategic plan. And then I'll share, um, and we'll talk a little bit about the significance of our five goals that have guided us these past 25 years and also will guide us for collective impact. Given that LEP is a leadership development program, I thought I should talk a little bit about leadership, right? <laughs> right? That makes sense, right? So I will spend time, and we will spend time, using an activity to look at what are some key attributes and characteristics that are necessary to lead diversity and inclusion, particularly in this time of unprecedented change. And then 
we will look at some specific measures of um, diversity inclusion that are in the collective impact plan and we'll talk a little bit about those and we'll talk from the standpoint of shared ownership that we all have ownership for actually all of the metrics not just those related to diversity and inclusion but also individual responsibility and so if time permits we will do an activity and I'm going to have to perhaps adjust the activity because I learned that we're live. Um, and so it may, it, it may not behoove us to have the live audience waiting for us to do our group activity. So we'll see how that goes. Um, and then um, if time permits, I'll talk broadly about what it will take. And I, and I just really shared two of them, individual responsibility and, and co-ownership. So I may not delve deeply into that. So that's what I've planned to, to share with you um, today as we think about, and I'm going to change it a little bit from my presentation. My presentation is going to be one UCF community collective impact, OK? It's always helpful um, before you really talk about where we're going. And collective impact, of course, is the university setting its course about where we're going over the next 20 years, what we aspire to be and to become as an institution using kind of a five-year roadmap to help us get there. But it's always helpful before you go there, before you go to you know, where you want to go, to just take a glimpse back uh, to look at where you've been and to look at where you are now. So if we think back to the founding of our institution, which was um, Florida Technological University at that time, uh, when it was formed, it was primarily what? A commuter campus, right? There were roughly 1,900 students, about two or three buildings, all of the degree plant programs were very specialized because the university was founded to really support the space industry, right? But there was one key element in our founding that still exists today. It's that common thread that has gone throughout the history of UCF. Does anyone know what that is? It begins with a P if that'll help you out partnerships. Remember, it was some citizens who got together and put their own money up to help us get UCF started. So we refer to that time period when it was FTU um, and it, when it was growing and emerging and coming to its own, we refer to that as version 1.0, UCF version 1.0. Is there anybody who was here, you know, been here 25, 26 years or more? Raise your hand. Wonderful, wonderful. So I'm calling you guys the groundbreakers, right? You set the foundation for what we're experiencing today. So let's give them a hand, actually. And you're still at work with us, right? So then, what happened in 1992? Dr. Hitt, President Hitt, um, became the fourth president of UCF. And he established these five goals and at that time these were forward-thinking groundbreaking visionary goals and they still are today right and then you see over the 25 years under his leadership right UCF transformed and it became not just focused on technological degrees which are important and we still do that very much to this day but we became much more comprehensive I think there are like 212 degree programs now um, when, when Dr. Hitt uh, took office, there were 20,000 um, students, and now we have 64,000 students. We're known for research not just related to space, but also a myriad of other uh, research interests, and we're rated as a high research university. But one thing we have never lost sight of, and that's the importance of a solid undergraduate education. It's also during this time period that we became an emerging preeminent institution. So this time period is called UCF version 2.0, right? So guess what collective impact has ushered in? UCF version what? 3.0. And on the screen, it shares what we mean by UCF 
version 3.0. Through collective impact, we will use the power of scale and the pursuit of excellence to solve tomorrow's greatest challenges and to make a better future for our students and for society. Through learning, discovery, and partnership, we transform lives and livelihoods. And collective impact is really about us in the institution all of our regional campuses, our Rosen campus, our College of Medicine, and our soon-to-be downtown campus, all of us working collectively together like never before to move UCF, right, um, to higher excellence so that we can impact more lives and have greater impact. Um, and it's also about that con constant pursuit of excellence. If you think back when the version 1.0, we probably, if you look on the screen, wherever they are, we probably would be, um, if you look and the, the scale is scale times excellence, we'd be kind of in that lower quadrant, 1,900 students. I'm sure the programs were really good, but no one could say they were preeminent just starting out at the gate, right, naturally. Um, and then you go to version 2.0. And how many of you have been here at least, you know, 10 years or more? Raise your hand. All right, a lot of people, right? You guys are the trendsetters because it's during version 2.0 that UCF took that upward trajectory where we are large, so we have 64,000 students, 12,000 employees, but we're also constantly improving our quality in all that we do. So you all are the, the, the um, trendsetters, so give yourselves a hand, trendsetters a hand. So let me talk just quickly to the version 3.0. How many have been like myself uh, with UCF less than a year? Be proud, be proud. Nobody else? Okay, just a few people, okay. We're riding on their coattails. No, 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 we're really not. We're, we're joining in with them in the collective. Those that are very seasoned that we saw here, those that were in the trending process of, of help, helping elevate us to emerging preeminence, now it's all of us time to elevate the institution to preeminence, right? And it's preeminence with a purpose. It's not just preeminence for the status, although, you know, status is nice, right? It's not just preeminence for whatever additional resources that may bring. Additional resources are also nice because they allow us to do even more impactful things. But it's preeminence because we know we can have a greater, right? social, economic, and cultural impact. We scale large because of our size. We can have a far-reaching, widespread impact. So enough of that. So hopefully that's a little grounding in collective impact. And just a quick formula, if you don't remember anything else I said, scale times excellence really do equal impact, and we're headed toward creating even greater impact for our students for the region. So quickly about the five goals. I love when Provost Whitaker talks about um, myth busters and how UCF is really challenging some deeply held beliefs in higher education. And, and also, in, in my view, there are false dichotomies that are always set up in higher education. And one false dichotomy is if you're a top leading research university, then you um, let your undergraduate programs suffer or you don't care as much about your undergraduate programs. And that is absolutely not true um, in UCF. And you'll see in collective impact a reinforcement of our commitment to strong undergraduate education, a commitment to um, having higher, even higher retention rates. And we've made a lot of progress in those areas of retention and graduation, but to have even higher retention and graduation rates, to provide our students with even more enriching and high impact practices, such as research and, and internships. So we're still very much committed, and we don't believe that myth, and we're proving that myth wrong about undergraduate education. And I'm gonna move a little quicker through these other ones international prominence in really all that we do, but certainly in our research and our graduate programs. Um, international focus in our curricula and research, become more inclusive and diverse, and we'll talk about that one a little bit, and be America's leading partnership university. So those are our five goals that are still salient and they're the foundation of collective impact. 
becoming more inclusive in diversity, and that's really what we're going to focus on is this particular um, goal. Think about this. 25 years ago, how many college presidents do you think were really thinking about diversity and inclusion 25 years ago? If they were thinking about it, how many universities do you think had it as a strategic goal 25 years ago? I said that to say this. We have fertile ground here at UCF. We have work to do as it relates to diversity and inclusion. Diversity and inclusion is, after all, right, it's, it's a journey. It's not a destination. I don't think we'll ever be done. As long as there's human variation and human differences, we'll find a way to divide ourselves, right? So I, I don't think our work will ever be done in that area, but we have fertile ground because we have long-standing, unwavering commitment from the top level of leadership and Dr. Hitt and Dr. Whitaker. But it behooves all of us to be leaders, too, in diversity and inclusion, right? So regardless of your title or your rank, we all have a role to play as leaders in diversity and inclusion. So let's talk about that. Let's look at some characteristics. You should have on your table um, a crossword puzzle. So if everybody will get that crossword puzzle and take the next five minutes to complete this crossword puzzle, and then we'll talk about the attributes that are in the puzzle. And for those of you live, reflect on what leadership <laughs> attributes are needed to drive diversity and inclusion. Take five minutes. You can work together if you like. <laughs> I see people like looking, keep looking. You can work together. And we're going to go over all of them as well. <laughs> you have two more minutes. And don't worry if you don't finish them all. We'll, we'll go over them.
one more minute. Okay, it's all right if you didn't get them all. We're, gonna, we're going to go over them now. And as we go over them, we're going to all say the answer together when we get to the blank for the answer, okay? How about that? All right, so let's start with one across. We demonstrate excellence in diversity and inclusion by drawing from research-based best practices and model programs. Programs, right? And the significance of this is that diversity and inclusion has a body of literature, right? There are effective strategies that have been studied and researched. And so as leaders and those advocating for diversity and inclusion, we must be informed, right, about those best practices and those model programs so that we can begin to advance those um, on our campus. So programs was the answer for number one. Let's go to number two across, two down, I'm sorry, two down. Leaders allocate resources, awesome, to advance strategic priorities related to diversity and inclusion, and I believe I have a couple of people who have microphones to, um, to sh if, if there's an audience member who wants to share. So what do you think, why do you think that's important in leadership of diversity and inclusion? You can raise your hand, they'll come to you with the mic. Here we go, right here. One will stay on one side and one stay on the other side, that'd be great, all right? I think there's only so much you can do with just a good idea. Beautifully said. And oftentimes, with deep diversity and inclusion work, it'll be understaffed and under-resourced. So how much can really be accomplished? If you ever want to see what a priority is of an organization, right, you follow what the money and see what's being funded. Unfortunately, I know of some diversity and inclusion offices for a whole university that has two people, right? So then that really suggests what the commitment is um, to that work. So as a leader, being cognizant of putting your money where your what is, where your mouth is, awesome. Seven across, we demonstrate excellence in diversity and inclusion by making institutional changes that, everybody's like, oh, that's it. <laughs> institutional changes that dismantle oppression and discrimination in all its forms. Does someone want to elaborate on that point? Think about this, right? So there's a lot of work to be done in diversity and inclusion, right? So diversity training is absolutely necessary, but it's not sufficient, right? Celebrating and creating an awareness of diversity through festivals and through programs are important, but they're not sufficient. In order to really make change, we have to look at the policy level, the procedure level, and really begin to dismantle things that um, impede progress, right? And so that's the level where leaders also operate, right? So that's what that point is. Let's go ahead with eight across since we're there. Leaders establish the vision, excellent, 
and goals for enhancing diversity and inclusion. Number nine, one of UCF's five goals is to become more, everybody better get that, <laughs> inclusive and diverse. That was kind of a giveaway, you know, to get, to get you going. Number 10, the desired impact of diversity and inclusion initiatives is to also transform lives and livelihoods. So everything about collective impact is about transforming lives and livelihoods. Number 11 across, leaders solve problems that impede progress towards diversity. Does anyone want to speak to that a little bit? Any thoughts or ideas on that one? Don't be shy. Don't be shy. So for this, what leaders really have to be cognizant of is that anything that we want to really achieve, we have to do what? We have to monitor it. We have to track it. And we have to analyze what's going right and what's not going so well, and then make those needed corrections. Diversity and inclusion is no different, right? So we have to be able to diagnose what those problems are, right? And then begin to move those problems and those barriers so that we can have the progress that we would like to have as it relates to diversity and inclusion. All right, let's go three um, down. This is another one of those kind of giveaways to get you going in the crossword puzzle. Scale times excellence equals impact, and that's true for diversity as well. Having far-reaching diversity initiatives that have great impact of changing um, not only the diversity and composition of UCF, but the climate and the environment and the, and the welcomeness that people feel and the respect that people feel when they're here. Number four down, leaders make decisions about the best way to solve the problems. Five down, Leaders motivate individuals. Someone said motivate, like we're sure. <laughs> yes, motivate individuals in the organization to work towards diversity goals. I know you've learned in your LEP program, for those who've either been through it or are in the program now, about the power. One of the key sources of power that leaders has is the ability to do what? It begins with an I, the ability to influence. And the ability is another I. I think I heard it, the ability to, right here, inspire. We have to do that same work with diversity and inclusion to bring others along uh, to join us in this important work. And lastly, six down. We demonstrate excellence in diversity and inclusion by removing, does anybody have that one? Systemic, where was that? I wish I had, yes. Removing systemic barriers to progress. We will never get anywhere by just working at the surface level. We have to dig deep into what, are there any systemic barriers, right, within our institution, right, that are setting up those power and privilege dynamics. All right, what's one takeaway that anyone has from this activity about leading diversity and inclusion? Who said that? Absolutely, it is hard work. But are we ready to roll up our sleeves to do even more of it? Yes, but it is hard work. And what does it take on the part of the leaders to do this work? Since it is hard, what does it take? Doesn't it take courage, right? Doesn't it take persistence, right? stick to and a resolve or resolve that things will be better. Because remember, diversity and inclusion is a work in progress. So thank you for that activity. So that's, that's the leadership piece of it. And in strategic impact, we have purposefully um, looked at how to move the needle in diversity and inclusion within UCF. And so you'll see when you review the collective impact strategic plan, you will see that one of the metrics is leading large Florida metropolitan area in the percentage of the population with bachelor's degrees or higher. And this is an important diversity imperative because we know that about eight to nine percent of students from low income 
families. So their families are at the lowest quartile on the income range. Only about eight to nine percent of them graduate from college, right? We also know that if you just happen through the birth lottery to be born into a family that is at the higher income quartile, 80 percent of those students will graduate with a college degree. You will probably not find this metric in any other strategic plan, but because Remember the fertile ground that diversity inclusion, at least for the last 25 years, has been an integral part of what we do? It's in our strategic plan. We want more individuals to experience the transformation that higher education can bring. At UCF, about 25% of our students are first generation. About 40% of our students are Pell Grant. But with this metric, we're saying we want to do more because we know when you earn a college degree, your life changes. What are some of the ways that your life changed? Well, one is your income. Lifetime earnings for someone who has a college degree versus someone who has um, just a high school diploma is over a million dollars in their lifetime earnings. There are some other benefits. We know that health indicators correlate positively with the more education you have. Your civic engagement and a host of other benefits come from having um, e exposure and the, the insight and the awareness and the mind opening that a college degree can bring and the access to more opportunities that the college degree can bring. And I'm very passionate about this particular metric because I'm a first generation student. I was raised in a rural town in eastern North Carolina, about 500 people. It's a phosphate mining town. There's no real work or industry. You have a choice. You can work in the mine. You can work on a farm, or you could drive about 30, 40 minutes and work in a factory. My mom worked in the factory for 30 years, never made more than $15,000 a year. She raised a family of four children, single parents, off $15,000 a year. She's the only one of her, she has eight siblings, she's the only one to have graduated from high school. And so she instilled in us that you will get an education because I know that is your way out. Long story short, all of my siblings have college degrees and two of us have advanced degrees. Our children, so all of my nieces and nephews, have college degrees. I have a niece who's a dentist with her own practice. I have a niece who's a nurse and working on her uh, FNP. I have a, a, a nephew who's a lawyer. And I could go on and on, very successful. My two boys are in high school and they are definitely college bound. So in one generation, through the power of higher education, we have broke generations of poverty generations my grandparents my mother's parents were subsistence farmers just getting by their parents were sharecroppers and you know what their parents were my great great grandparents were enslaved so in one generation so that's what the promise of UCF is the promise of UCF and that's why these are not mere metrics. There are metrics with deep meaning behind them because they change lives. When I think about the lives of my, sis my siblings in my life, it was higher education. So we want to, within this region, through this metric, we want to make that avail to more citizens of the region. Isn't that something you can get behind? Isn't that something worth fighting for? Right? What are the other metrics? Enroll a student population whose family incomes reflect the distribution of the region for, this, for similar reasons. The data I shared with you about only 8 to 9% graduate. We've made a lot of progress on that at UCF, but we want to do more. We want to enroll a student population that reflects the demographic diversity. There's richness, right, in having people from different backgrounds. So we want to do more of that. We are already at about 45% of our undergraduate students identify themselves as being a member of a minority group. 
But we want to make sure that's truly a reflection. That's good, and a lot of institutions would rest on that laurel. But we, wanna, we want it to truly, our enrollment to truly reflect uh, the demographics of the region. We also have some metrics that are related to faculty and, and staff diversity as well, because that's critically important. One of them is to achieve 25% in employment of underrepresented groups from tenure and tenure track new hires who are retained for five or more years. So I think there are two key pieces to this, and also not just tenure and tenure track faculty. We also want non-tenured faculty, administrative um, and, and professional new hires to be diverse as well. So we're looking for all new hires to have 25% of which would be from underrepresented groups and that they would be retained. And the two important pieces to that, right, is not just bringing in diversity, but it's retaining that diverse talent. And we're deeply committed to that in collective impact, right? And many times when you see, if you see, and in most strategic plans, you won't see accountability metrics related to diversity and inclusion. But if you do, oftentimes they don't talk about retention. And that's the key. You can have what we call in higher education a revolving door. You bring in talent, so you bring in women in non-traditional fields. Or you bring in members of GLBTQ community. Or you bring in more professionals of color. But the climate isn't conducive to them being successful. So it's called the revolving door they leave. And then what do you think happens? Your institution absolutely gets a negative reputation. So we're, we're as cognizant at UCF, we're as cognizant about the need to recruit the diverse talent as we are the need to retain the diverse talent. And yes, we still have work to do. But it's up to every one of us in the room and to all of those out there live, all of those at our other campuses, it's all of us to make this climate what it needs to be. We've done a lot of great work, a lot of great work yet to do. Another metric in the strategic plan that really um, is about diversity at its core is a community-related metric, and that is that we will define and launch at least one major collective university-wide initiative that tr addresses a social problem. And we'd want to do this in a specific community, right? And addressing specific needs and challenges of that community and bringing the depth and breadth of expertise from UCF, across UCF, across every college, every unit, every center, right? Bringing whatever expertise they have to lend to this issue to really begin to move the needle on an issue. And I argue that you won't find a metric like that in most university strategic plans. So we definitely have here at UCF the commitment, right? The commitment to change, the commitment. Now we roll up our sleeves and be about the work. I was going to do a group exercise, but because I know now that I have a live audience, I'm going to not do that. Um, and we're going to um, proceed and do some, uh, some other little things that I think will still work with the live audience. So now I've shared with you what the metrics are related to diversity and the collective impact strategic plan. And so what will it take to achieve these metrics? It's going to take alignment. It's going to take looking across our institution at whatever policies, procedures, structures, you know, protocols, whatever we have, making sure they support the collective impact strategic plan. And I love the quote, I can't change the direction of the wind, but I can adjust my sails to always reach my destination. We can't change how people feel in their heart of hearts about diversity and inclusion. But we can take a stand about if you're going to be a member of this UCF community, right? what behaviors are acceptable, right? And we have to do that through alignment, through everyone thinking about how what I'm doing supports our enhanced diversity and our enhanced inclusion. Also, co-ownership. 
you may think, you know, particularly on some of the, the metrics, if you don't work with students, you may think, I really can't address the metrics. I don't, I don't work with students. I would argue that all of us can play some role in all the metrics. Certainly, your sphere of influence and your role and responsibilities will determine which metric you are most engaged in and most involved in. But I'm, I'm asking, I'm asking my UCF community to stretch yourself and think about how can I even help in an area that's not directly linked to what I do uh, day to day. That's called co-ownership of that collective impact strategic plan and that's what we need from you. Think about this. So one of the, one of the metrics um, that we, we just discussed is to, you know, um, increase the income diversity and demographic diversity of our students. And you may say, I don't really work with students. But there are things that, that you can do. I'm going to give you an example from my previous institution. I, I've been here seven months. But I, so I'll give you an example from my previous institution. My previous institution had a scholarship called PAC Promise for low income students. The problem was, in a lot of the rural areas, in isolated areas like where I'm from, in a lot of the inner city areas, didn't know about this scholarship. They had absolutely no idea. And so I arranged to go to my hometown and do presentations for clubs, for church youth groups, any organization that would let me in the door to tell the parents and the students. And I started with those at a young age that focus on your academics. Don't think you can't go to college just because you live in this community. Your parents may not have all the resources and funds that you think you need to go. There are ways. So that's something you can do. You can be in your community sharing about UCF. You can be an ambassador. You can reach where you can reach. You don't have to work in enrollment services to help us with that metric, right? I know enrollment services also needs volunteers to come when they bring students. They need, them, need you to come and, and spend time with the students so they can see people who look like them. That's very, very important. If you are a young lady wanting to pursue STEM or some of the sciences, it's important to have some women scientists there to greet them, to say, I've done this. I can show you the way. I can work with you. So we all have to take that shared ownership. The next key piece of making any of these metrics successful is individual responsibility. Purposefully and intentionally thinking about what can I do? So not to help someone else, but to help the work that I'm doing advance um, collective impact. And I love the quote from the great philosopher and critical thinker, uh, Phil Jackson, who was the basketball coach for which team was the LA Lakers. I love this quote. The strength of the team is each individual member. The strength of each individual member is the team. We need you to get, remember that, that scale times excellence I showed? To get to that farthest right upward corner where we've maximized our scale totally and we've reached the highest levels of excellence. To get there, we need you. And we need you to take even more individual responsibility for those metrics that you have an opportunity to influence. And then finally, collective action, working together like never before, right? We've always worked together at UCF, right? But enhancing that, working together even more, and being accountable, um, stating what our goals are, which we've clearly done in collective impact, and then holding our feet to the fire. And that's so true of diversity and inclusion, holding our feet to the fire about progress. We know, have you guys heard the saying, what gets measured gets done. What people have to report against gets done well. And what people are rewarded for gets repeated. So we have to make sure we build in that accountability and that incentive and that reward. And that's how we we'll began to move the needles on these, um, these metrics. All right, so I know I've given you a lot to think about. 
And now I want to have you do just that, right? So this is called Think Pair Share. I know that some tables have nine, so it might be um, three people and not two. But really spend about one minute each sharing with your partner what you're going to commit to today with regards to collective impact. And since we're around diversity and inclusion, focus it on diversity and inclusion. Discuss one thing that you're going to commit to doing to drive diversity and inclusion more at UCF. So take a minute each. I'll let you know when it's time to switch. I'll time the minute so that to make sure everybody has time to, to, to speak. If it's three of you, you're going to have about 30 seconds each. <laughs> All right, so you can begin. And then we're gonna, I'm gonna ask people to share, so don't be shy. One thing, and for those of you live, I want you to reflect and think about one thing that you're going to do as well. Okay, thank you. That's very good. Thank you. Okay, time to switch. Okay, thank you. All right, so thank you guys for sharing. If I could have the other person with the mic. Let's see what some of the take takeaways in terms of what you're going to do uh, and how you're going to help us. Um, is there anyone who'd like to share? Anyone who just has something wonderful and unique that they wanna do and they wanna share? Don't be shy. There we go. <laughs> Hello, everyone. My name is Andrea. One of my biggest things is you said something about people enjoy going where they see themselves. Um, it's very important for those students. So one of my things that I wanted to do was just one word, be visible. Oh, that's beautiful. That's very well done. Very well said. That's so important. Anyone else like to share? Okay, here we go. I think the university could look at single faculty and students. So many of our events for students that are in transition or in the master's programs and so forth are focused on family. And there are very few events that are focused on single faculty, diverse um, personalities, diverse groups or not, mm -hmm. that don't have a voice here. Wonderful, thank you. Let's give her a hand. So to me, that just speaks of being cognizant to say, whenever we have something, who's not here? And why aren't they here? And let's have, make sure it's inclusive for all. Thank you. Very good. We have another person who'd like to share? Hello. Um, so encouraging our student staff members to get involved with on-campus 
um, resources like the SET program. We have a student enhancement team program, and it allows them to get involved with diversity classes and Title IX and customer service. So getting the students out there as well as our own you know, full-time employee colleagues. Absolutely. So training for the students in addition to training for employees is so important because we're putting our students out in industry, in um, organizations, uh, and we want them to be able, you know, because in, in workplaces are becoming increasingly diverse, right? And so we want them to have the tools, right, to be able to interculturally communicate and, uh, and to be a good global citizen. Awesome. Anyone else? No? Okay. Did we give her a hand too? We <laughs> don't want to. Don't want to be remiss in forgetting that. Excellent. Thank you for sharing. And I hope, even if you didn't share, you know, um, openly, I hope you did, though, spend a little time to reflect on what you can bring to this personally, right? And that re this reflection doesn't have to just be for this session, right? Take this with you and continue to look, you know, for opportunities by which you can help us um, transform lives and livelihoods. All right. So my my closing thought then, um, I've quoted everyone else right today. So this is this is kind of my my desire and, and my wish of how we're going to make collective impact successful. The success of collective impact institutionalization or execution is contingent upon all of us bringing our unique knowledge base, skill set, expertise together in collective ownership of the goals that are outlined in the strategic plan and using our collective best thinking to determine how to achieve the goals and taking collective actions to create impacts that transform lives and livelihoods of our students, our community, our region, and beyond because truly if you if you really delve into collective impact a lot of the metrics that we want to achieve certainly are designed to impact our students our community and the region but they also have implications and significance nationally and globally so the impact will stretch beyond our campus and our in our region okay so that's all I have for you today about collective impact. And hopefully you, you feel more encouraged or motivated or inspired to take an even a more active role um, in our collective impact strategic plan and moving forward in institutionalizing the plan. And now I'll entertain any questions that you have for me in the few moments we have left. Any questions? No questions. OK, there we go. Hello, can you speak to the importance of um, mem um, mentorship? You mentioned it earlier when you first mm -hmm. got up. Can you speak a little more about the importance of mentorship? Absolutely. So mentorship is so critically important, right? You don't know what you don't know. And oftentimes, there are ways in which you can make certain decisions that can help put you on course to where you want to be or other decisions that can derail you. So having someone to provide that advice to you, that guidance to you, um, is so critically important. And what we're finding and what the literature really has found is that oftentimes, underrepresented groups don't have that person taking them by the hand and um, showing them the ropes, if you will. We don't get anywhere by ourselves, right? And also, a second piece of that is at certain point, the higher up you go at certain points, you have proven yourself in terms of your content expertise and your knowledge, right? And so it then becomes not as much about what you know as who you know, and who can sponsor you, and who can say, hey, put Lisa on this committee. 
This will give her a good exposure to learn new things. So who can be your champion? Who can be your sponsor? Those are the things that makes the difference the higher up you go. So that's a, that's a beautiful question. And what, what we find, unfortunately, is, and it's not all times that it's um, you know, necessarily intentional, but the impact is still the same, or the negative effect is, is still the same. And I don't oftentimes try to, to judge what people's intentions are because I don't know. But what I can say is the net effect is we don't have as many underrepresented persons in the higher levels of leadership. The department chair is on up. Beautiful question. Any other questions? So, so piggybacking off that question while you think if you have another question for me. Do you have to wait till you get to be a senior leader to be a mentor? No. You should always be paying it forward. You should always be reaching back and helping someone. And I tell the persons that I mentor, and yes, I do have a couple of students that have latched on to me, even in the seven months, and a couple of faculty who have latched on to me. Um, I want you to do more than what I've done. I want to be able to catapult you to beyond what I've done. And you look for a mentor. So I'm talking to the LEP 2017 class. You have mentors through this program. Seek out other mentors. Different mentors can give you different nuggets of information. Different mentors have different networks that they can connect you to. So don't focus on the mentor you have for the program, but seek out Certainly stay connected with the mentor you have for the program, but seek out additional mentors as well, right, to guide and help your career path. Are there any other questions? Yes. Well, I just want to say thank you for speaking to us today, and you kind of uh, just brought it up, but I just want to know in your short time at UCF, what are some of the um, tangible things that you think our institution can be better at, and how can a professional like me who is low on the totem pole, um, so to speak, connect to, the, to those different things? Well, first of all, I don't believe in low on the totem pole and high on the totem pole. I think every role at this institution is critically important, right? Every single person on this campus contributes to the success of this campus. So that's first of all. And second of all, what have I noticed? I've only been here seven months, to be honest, and as an, as an employee, and I've been so engulfed in getting collective impact strategic plan off the ground, I, I really don't think I'm at liberty to say what could be better uh, at this point. Um, yes, I am, actually. <laughs> so one thing, I just thought of it, I, I do think, um, as I interface with, um, again, leadership, department heads, deans, on up, um, there could be more diversity in leadership at UCF, right, to be honest. And so that's why LEP is so important for training that next generation of leaders. I love how it was said in the LEP materials, the rising stars, nurturing those rising stars and giving them opportunities to serve on key committees or take on key projects to continue to hone those skills so that they don't feel like they're so low on the totem pole, but giving them exposure, right? And letting their talents shine, right? And then giving them opportunities. And so I, I do think that is something. Um, but to be honest, um, I've been in, in higher education for 23 years. One of the things that impressed me is I've never been at an institution with this many female senior leaders. When I looked at the vice presidents, when I went to the first vice presidents meeting, you know, I was just like, wow. There were several female vice presidents um, around the table. I think at that meeting, there were like four or five, and I was just totally impressed. So we're making a lot of progress, but I still think we have progress to make as it relates to um, increasing diversity in the most senior most positions on our campus. I think we're out of time. We're out of time. So I just want to say thank you so much. I have been so honored to have this opportunity to speak with such an important group. And I really appreciate it. And I hope you have at least one takeaway from today. So thank you.
Well, we just want to thank you, Dr. Jones, for this incredible speech. Um, Shamika and I have Shamika and I have planned the speaker committee, so Shamika has your gift. But I just want to say that <laughs> <laughs> I was doing the crossword, and my hu and I only got about four of them. <laughs> my husband's like, "You're failing the quiz. What have you been doing all year?" You know. <laughs> so um, the great thing about LEP is like listening and meeting motivated, like powerful, extremely powerful women like Dr. Jones, and you can bet that I'm going to be knocking on your please, door. <laughs> please, please. And, and it, gives, um, it gives us hope uh, that, that uh, UCF will be one of the universities that <laughs> begins to be the change um, here. So thank you for thank this you. great speech. And um, Shamika is going to introduce our next um, panelists. So. Oh, it's Jacob. Sorry, Jacob's going to introduce the panelists. All right, so we have a small set change at this point as we get ready for our panel. Uh, so we can take about a 10-ish minute intermission. So feel free to grab some more snacks from the hallway, grab some more beverages, and we will be back uh, at... 1010 to begin our next phase of the morning.
for what we say. See you later or anything else like that. Te ves regia. All right. Hello again, everyone. <laughs> Welcome back. I know there were still plenty of fruit and pastries outside, so ho hopefully everyone had a chance to stock up or grab some coffee. We are going to jump right into our panel discussion this morning. We are really excited about this panel. This is a pretty common format for us in LEP. We have panels every time we meet as a group, and it really is a great way to get lots of different perspectives and knowledge on a variety of topics and get some great dialogue started about uh, all of our experiences and activities and, and how we can kind of come together to benefit uh, the Central Florida and UCF community. So that is our theme at this point is, is kind of broadening some of that collective impact to talk a little bit more about uh, the greater Central Florida community and what we can do to be excellent partners and connect with uh, all of the folks that we serve. So I'm going to introduce our panelists and then we will jump right into questions. As I said earlier, we want some questions from you all as well. And so when we reach that point in the festivities, I will uh, ask for some questions from our group. First, we have Dr. Rosa Cintrone who is an associate professor here at the University of Central Florida in the College of Education and Human Performance, specifically in the Higher Education and Policy Studies program. And I have actually taken a class with Dr. C, uh, so she's great. Uh, her first, <laughs> I'm not currently enrolled in a class with Dr. C, but hopefully those will bank for a future semester. Uh, her first career was in the mental health field, working as a bilingual psychotherapist in Puerto Rico, Connecticut, and New York. Her academic career started in the early 1980s at the State University of New York College at Old Westbury. Since then, she has occupied various positions as staff, administrator, and faculty in colleges and universities in the states of New York, Illinois, Oklahoma, and Florida. She was the first Hispanic dean at the University of Oklahoma and in the Oklahoma State System of Higher Education. She is the past chair of the Faculty Fellows for the National Association of the Student Affairs Administrators in Higher Education, NASPA, and holds various other leadership positions in professional associations. Her book, College Student Death, Guidance for Caring Campus, co-authored with Aaron Taylor and Catherine Garlow, has been listed among the most important academic resources for dealing with crisis intervention. Her research agenda and expertise are related to social justice in higher education, identity, marginality, and power, and qualitative methodology, contouring voice, self, and persona. Her philosophy on teaching has been shaped by the tenets proposed by the following scholars. Boyer, which is scholarship reconsidered, Palmer, the courage to teach, and Ender and Associates, contributing to learning the role of student affairs. She considers teaching an honor and working at the university a privilege. Dr. Rosa Cintrone or Dr. C. Our second panelist this morning is Mr. Michael Farmer. Um, Michael began his advocacy at age 17 when he and a group of his friends started a great gay straight alliance, GSA, at Apopka High School in a conservative part of Central Florida. While he was a student at Valencia College, Michael served at the Valencia College campus organizer for the Fairness for All Families campaign, FFAF, a campaign to defeat constitutional amendments to ban marriage equality and civil unions in Florida. Michael went on to serve as the Orlando area, uh, Orlando area field organizer for FFAF. Michael joined the staff of Equality Florida in 2009 as the organization's Safe Schools Policy and GSA Network Coordinator. As Equality Florida's GSA Network Coordinator, Michael trained hundreds of students and teachers across the state on best practices for making schools safe for LGBT youth. From 2010 to 2012, Michael served as Equality Florida's statewide field coordinator. In this role, Michael helped to increase Equality Florida's pro-equality voter file by more than 20,000 voters. Additionally, he raised Equality Florida's profile at community events and mobilized Equality Florida members and pro-equality voters to deliver victories for pro-equality and open LGBT candidates all over Florida. In 2013, Michael moved to the role of statewide field director. As statewide field director, Michael led Equality's 
of Florida's field staff on programs related to voter education, identification, mobilization, and built Equality Florida's member engagement. Currently, Michael serves as Equality Florida's Director of Development for Central and North Florida, where he leads Equality Florida's development programs and staff in Orlando, Sarasota, Jacksonville, and Tallahassee. Since 2012, Michael and his team across the state have raised over $1 million for LGBT equality in Florida. In 2012, Michael was nominated as one of the advocates 40 under 40 activists in the nation, and he was recently recognized by Congressman Alan Grayson as one of the top 50 LGBT leaders in Florida and honored by having his accomplishments read into the congressional record. Michael regularly represents Equality's, Equality Florida's initiatives and programs on local TV and in print media. Michael is a graduate of the University of Central Florida and holds a bachelor's degree in political science with a concentration on American politics and public policy. Mr. Michael Farmer. <laughs> Last but not least, Mr. Brian Gray. Brian Gray is the Vice President of Organizational Capability at Wyndham Vacation Ownership and is a seasoned professional who's worked in a diverse range of disciplines in retail, banking and finance, telecommunications, and vacation ownership industries. He joined Wyndham Vacation Ownership in 2004 as Manager of Consumer Finance, Learning and Development, and in 2006 moved to corporate role of supporting accounting and finance, communications, and brand management, IT, legal, resort operations, and sales and marketing for North America's Central, Western, and Pacific regions. That sounds like a lot. <laughs> in 2012, he assumed responsibility for leading the organizational effectiveness team in supporting the development and execution of programs, tools, systems, and processes related to building Wyndham Vacation Ownership's organizational capability through strategic talent management. Today, he works with senior business leaders concerning his enterprise-wide range of management initiatives concerning organizational capability, including culture and diversity and inclusion. Prior to joining the company, Mr. Gray served in the series of successful leadership positions with Bank of America, uh, NT and SA uh, culminating with his positions as Assistant Vice President and Area Operations Manager. He then served as Manager, Talent Management and Integration for Verizon Communications Live Source Business Merger Integration Team. Wyndham Vacation Ownership Inc. is the world's largest vacation owned ownership company with more than uh, 915,000 owner families and more than 180 resorts located throughout the United States, Canada, Mexico, and the Caribbean and South Pacific. The company worldwide employs more than 1,500 or 15,000 associates worldwide. Mr. Brian Gray. And so we will have some of the questions that I will be asking this morning on the slides, uh, so you in the audience can take a look at those as we move forward. Our first question this morning uh, is, in what way have, you, have diversity and inclusion been a driving force in your career path and in your current responsibilities? Whoever wants to start can start. I'll go ahead and start first. Um, it's interesting because I, I, I read this question and I'm thinking about it and I just listen to my bio and I'm like absolutely nothing around diversity and inclusion is part of that but it's been a huge part of my role um, in the world. Um, I would have said probably diversity and inclusion didn't play a role in my life until probably four or five years ago um, but I realize now a big, con a big part of that uh, really impacted my early career and moving me along in the fact that um, as a gay man who was closeted I hid but was able to identify with other people who were um, under-recognized in the business community and was able to move very successfully through helping develop them and developing myself and moving along. But really, if you start to look at how diversity and inclusion um, impacted me, it would probably be five years ago when I came out worldwide as the executive sponsor for our pride group and took over diversity and inclusion for our company and starting to look at that. And the ability to be uh, recognized myself as a whole authentic person has changed how I um, present myself and how I work in my career. And because of that, um, my career has accelerated in the last five years like it never had in the first 25. Um, but I think the ability early on without understanding what diversity and inclusion was as a teacher, as um, I worked for the LA Board of, um, LA Board of Education for two years, and worked in um, South Central LA and understanding and being able to connect with a diverse community definitely impacted who I am as a person and as a leader. 
Um, and so for me, diversity and inclusion has been a big impact that I'm probably only starting to recognize fully um, now in my, in my work that I'm doing. Buenos dias. Good morning. First of all, I would like to thank uh, the leadership for inviting me to this panel. And I have to highlight the fact that I feel so happy, satisfied to see so many people that I know, but especially my students. Uh, what impact has affirmative action, uh, policies of inclusion, and diversity have had in my life? And as you notice, I included affirmative action, which is not in the question. But I would like for you to know that it was the most powerful influence uh, in my life if I put together these three words, affirmative action, diversity, and inclusion. I in what way? In what way? I am here today. I am here today. And every week, I get to be, twice a week, in front of my graduate students, masters and doctoral students, because of these policies. Without these policies, I would not have been a member of this community. I would not have been a faculty member at the highest level of the academy. I have graduated 51 doctors in this nation. And it is only because of the opportunity that was given to me through efforts of diversity and inclusion. Again, why has it been so powerful? Because I am here today in front of you. You know, I think for me, uh, I was really first called to really participate in, in the work of diversity and inclusion when I was a student uh, at Apopka High School and I saw how the lack of diversity and inclusion, particularly for LGBTQ students, resulted in uh, serious bullying um, and uh, mental and emotional health issues as a result of that. Um, and that was uh, more than 10 years ago and I have been involved uh, in this work ever since. And most of my focus has been in the, in the public sphere, the civic sphere, making sure that LGBTQ people are included in, in institutions that we all care about, marriage, uh, uh, civil rights laws, uh, making sure that predatory practices like conversion therapy aren't perpetrated against our young LGBTQ youth. And so um, for me, although most of my focus is on uh, diversity and inclusion in our public uh, and civic and political spheres, um, a big part of Equality Florida's work is also ensuring that uh, you know the work that's done uh, nine to five in institutions like uh, uh, UCF uh, is inclusive of people no matter what their gender identity or their sexual orientation. So um, we focus a lot on making sure that transgender people uh, through our trans inclusion program are able to bring their whole selves to work and live their, their authentic lives. So uh, diversity and inclusion for LGBTQ people uh, can of often uh, prevent things like suicide and actually literally save their lives and that's one of the reasons why uh, I'm so passionate about this work. Thank you. And so our second question, uh, there are a number of current social issues that affect a broad range of UCF students and Central Florida community members. For example, UCF uh, has been or will uh, soon be designated as a Hispanic serving institution and soon will have a gender inclusive living learning community and housing and residence life. Um, in what, in your experience, can you suggest we do to support underrepresented students, including those who may not be at the forefront of some of these social issues? Well, I, I think that UCF is a, is a powerful voice in our civic and political discourse. And I think that, you know, when we talk about brain drain in our communities, um, you know, it, it's, it's amazing the, the work that UCF is doing to increase diversity and inclusion on campus. But we also have to be thinking as an institution about the five to nine, not just the nine to five. Um, and uh, the work that so many people are working so hard on here on campus, um, you, you know, it will be only amplified, you know, the, the efforts uh, that are happening here have got to also happen in the world that we live in and the state that we live in. We still live in a state where you can be fired, kicked out of a home, or denied service at a restaurant just because you're lesbian, gay, bisexual, or transgender. 
We still live in a state uh, where uh, only 19 of our 67 school districts have fully inclusive uh, bullying and harassment policies that protect LGBTQ youth. And these are things that uh, people look at when they want to uh, uh, fully uh, experience a place and where they want to live in a place. And we've got to do the work that we can to attract the best and the brightest talent um, to our university and to our state. Last night, <clears throat> as I was trying to uh, close some of my answers to these questions and be prepared for today, I said, uh, should I be disruptive or should I be accommodating? <laughs> uh, and I decided to be accommodating. <laughs> OK? So if any one of you want to be disruptive, Go ahead. Uh, because being disruptive uh, can have consequences. And today, I'm not into having any consequences. <laughs> it's Friday the weekend. <laughs> um, but this question was problematic for me. And this is why it is problematic. And I'm being accommodating. <laughs> it says designated as a Hispanic serving institution. Uh, I read the legislation just very quickly. And I know that the emphasis of the legislation mentions students, a part of it. But the legislation really has to do with the structure, the belly of the institution. And the question is that if we are a Hispanic serving institution, when I look around, it doesn't look Hispanic to me. So, uh, <laughs> and, and I mean the legislation is, is very clear that there must be changes in the structure of that university. That's why universities get a lot of money from the feds uh, to have this structural change from the president's office down. And uh, I am a member of, of this campus and I consider it an honor. But that doesn't mean that I'm blind. So that that is very close to my heart. And uh, I know that at this point, we don't have any heavy echelon administrator representing the Hispanic voice. And I don't mean at the associate director staff. I mean a vice president that is able to carry out the voice of the Hispanic Matters. Uh, what can we do to support underrepresented students? When it comes to Hispanic, we are at a critical point in our nation, as you know. Uh, there are some current policies that will make it impossible for some of our kids and younger adults to join higher education. They will be sent back home, deported. Um, now, I'm not into your politics, but I am into your moral decisions of what is right and what is wrong, especially for a nation that claims to be Christian, uh, because there is something that says that we have a very clear responsibility to those that are the widows, the widowers, the children, and the foreigners. So I have tried very hard in my life to have some sort of integrity of values. Uh, and I think that this is the time for us, independently of your politics and even your religion, to have a very clear position 
in terms of what is going to happen to many people in our nation. Uh, and since I represent the Hispanic constituency, I think that I have to say what, what can we do to support the unrepresented students that have a Hispanic uh, surname, Hispanic culture, Hispanic parents, Hispanic status. Uh, I think that uh, the institution has to create a safe haven. And, and I'm saying a lot. I'm saying a very controversial thing, but I will, I will be so honored to work for that type of courageous institution. And we are not there yet. So in thinking about the question, and looking at it, um, the part that became problematic for me was the word support. Um, because one of the things I can look at it, and I look, you know, my background is, is business and that, so I look at it from a business perspective, but I really see when you're looking at students, you're looking at faculty, whoever that is, or in business or whatever, employees, whatever it looks like, I think we're at a point where, and I think this actually came out a little bit in the election as well, where we need to stop supporting and engaging the people in the, in the process. Because I'm hearing, and I've had a lot of conversations and dialogues in the business community over the last year, where I'm tired of hearing the intention, I'm tired of seeing the recognition, the award that my company gets. But I don't feel it, and I don't feel a part of it when I'm in the environment. So, Thinking that we have people's best intention is great in trying to assist, but not including them in the process is the big failure. It's that inclusion piece. It's the action that you have to have. So supporting, yes, but really supporting is helping them get engaged in the dialogue and the conversation and the decision making that's ha happening and occurring um, across the board. And it's not assuming that people are going to be pegged into different areas around where they want to be a part of that inclusion behind it because the diversity that we're looking for individuals is being defined by them, not by us. So when you sit back and you look at people, you can't just assume because of a Hispanic surname or because of their color skin or their LGBT or whatever it is that that's one that they, where they want to play and they want to be involved in, and two, that's all they want to be limited to. Because most of us will sit, can sit back and look and count three, four, five, ten, fifteen ways we'll look and identify ourselves as being diverse. And if we are not helping them in the definition of defining that for themselves and engaging in what it takes to help move people up, forward, whatever that is, we're not going to succeed. So in reading the strat plan and going through all of it and seeing what all the metrics are, what you're trying to hit, phenomenal. But my question all the way through is how and with who? Because that's what's key, is how are you going to do it and with who? Because if you don't understand that, then you're not going to be really successful. You may hit a metric, but the metric is only going to be a number that's not going to be what is going to make a difference or a shift in how um, the community, the school, business, the people around are transforming, if you will. Great conversation we had before. But you need to look at that and being inclusive and not just supporting. They have to be a part of the process. Thank you. Our next question. Leadership institutes such as this one promote a better understanding of diversity and inclusiveness. What are some other activities that you would suggest the university and community promote to educate ourselves and others? Uh, I, mean, I think that the uh, UCF, uh, you know, uh, becoming, uh, ha obviously this is an institution that has a legislative agenda. Um, and when we talk about uh, the world that we live in, whether you're uh, a Latino or whether you're an LGBTQ person, we live in a state that 
um, is, is often passing policy that really impacts the lives of these people. Um, and uh, I think that uh, UCF being uh, positioning itself in a bolder way around these issues um, that, that everyone at this institution cares about is one of the most impactful ways that, um, that they could help the lives of these people by um, really coming out in a bolder, more forthcoming way in terms of their legislative agenda in Tallahassee um, around uh, diversity and inclusion and making sure that our state uh, represents the values of this institution. So how do we promote or educate others in understanding diversity and inclusiveness? I think that one area key to this will be through the curriculum. But it has to be like a natural flow in the curriculum. We just cannot have a week or a month dedicated to issues of inclusiveness and diversity and say that, that we're accomplishing that. I think that it has to be a normal part of every single field, from the hard sciences, the engineers, uh, photonics, to the social sciences. It is part of every single class that we will include issues of um, inclusiveness for all kinds of people. Okay, I, I agree, it is all kinds of people. Not every citizen of our nation is included in the table. And what is it that they say? If you're not on the table, you're part of the menu. So we still have a long way to go to include others. And others for me, for example, I have become very concerned about issues of social class. Uh, I, I don't think that many colleges and universities, in spite of the uh, crisis that we have with uh, loans and uh, the, the cost of the university, I don't think that we have reached down to the really poor citizens of our nation in terms of social class. And how do we engage them so that our students will know and understand that social class diversity and inclusion is important? Uh, I don't really know. I'm a faculty member, so m most of the time I deal with ideas, uh, sometimes with action, but not not regularly, but I think that maybe courses in that will require service learning in inviting uh, our students to communities that are really socially, economically depressed uh, should be like another issue of, of responsibility. These are what educated citizens of our nation should dedicate their life in giving something back to the citizens that paid for a little part of their education. So I think that we must educate in, in terms of having institutes like this on issues of social class and how important money or the lack of money is in our nation today. Just to build off that quickly in the inclusiveness of being it, um, I'll, I'll speak to it from the business side because that's what I understand a, a little bit better in the fact that right now when you talk about um, educating and promoting it with others and educating them about it, that becomes the event that you were talking about and, and we look at it. And from a business side, what I will say, what's happening is you have your business that you're running and your operations and then you have a human resource side around diversity and inclusion that at time intersects with the business but is not part of it. And so what we're looking at and driving now is figuring out how do you operationalize diversity and inclusion in everything that you do. So from a user university perspective is that there should be a DNI component to everything. If you're, de if you're um, how you're recruiting and how you're developing your curriculum and how you're engaging, whatever aspect of the university invol is involved in, in the operation of it, where is the DNI piece to it? Because until it's included, you can educate people all you want, but people in the end have objectives they have to hit. And if DNI is not part of that objective, and if you're not looking through your curriculum with a DNI lens to see how I need to position what I'm teaching or how it translates back into the field, the knowledge is great, but it's not going to be meaningful to someone 
are actionable later on. So you've got to figure out how DNI becomes part of it, not a subset or a, it's a lane running along that once in a while we'll have a session like this. So promote and educate, yes, but do it through the actual functioning of the university, not as a separate event. That's what I would look at. I think that's a really good segue, yes. <laughs> to our next question. Uh, so how can staff and faculty get involved and or serve, whether that's as mentors, you know, to colleagues and students, uh, to support an environment that fosters respect and inclusion? Uh, how can we let leaders like you know that we would like to be a part of this process? Uh, and some examples of that might include serving on committees uh, or other activities. I'll go ahead and start and talk about, for me, so my advice to you would be, I'll take it from the point of what it did for me. So I started getting involved with DNI organizations myself and, and learning about that. I talk about the fact that um, I will be 56 in two days. I didn't come out to most people until I was 51. I'm not a, what I call a professional gay. I don't understand a lot of the political work that's been done. But what I will say and how I got educated was connecting with people who understood and knew and who I could learn from. And, and being able to look at it and gauge from that point. And while segue into is maybe it's not looking at you becoming the mentor, but maybe the mentee. And finding someone who already knows um, about that. For me, in my world, and moving to Central Florida, uh, Gina Duncan, who is worth Equality Florida, was a huge educator and mentor of mine around what is going on politically in the world and especially from a, a transgender um, perspective. So find people that you can connect with and find a mentee that can help you through whatever aspect you're trying to work. Then you will become a better mentor for others in, in being able to help educate them in this space. I want to think that there is a mistake in this question. It says, how can we, as staff and faculty, you forgot the administrators. How can we, as staff, faculty, and administrators, get involved? And the rest. I think it is key to put administrators there, because the administrators usually are the one with the power of decision making. Staff and faculty can jump up and down, but the, uh, the power of the university is within the hands of the administrators. I would like to think that it is in the hands of a strong faculty senate for governance, yes. But at the end, we, the administrators, are the one with the legal power to make decisions. So I think that these three constituencies are very important in serving as mentors. Now, there was a point in my life that I believe in mentoring in a very general way, but then I read a book years ago by uh, Arthur Levine, or Levine, called Against All Odds. And he proposes that mentoring like that in a generalized way doesn't really work. That for mentoring to be powerful, it has to do with a very specific time in a very specific space. That we all can be mentors in a very specific time, in a very specific space. That when we see a student or a faculty or an administrator that needs our support, or that is saying or doing things that are not right. We should be the mentors right there and then. And then it is powerful. That if you are in a situation that people are saying things that they should not be saying and they need a little mentoring, you should act there and then. No way for the university to develop a mentoring uh, institute or a mentoring program. It doesn't work that way. It really works, I think, as Angela, uh, Angelo said. If, if you come to my house 
she said, if you come to my house and you make a joke that is inappropriate, right there and then I have to say, not in my house. Not in my house. And that's powerful intervention. That's powerful mentoring. And I think that that is what we should strive to do with our students, with our staff, and with our administrators when we are in an active mentoring role. We are all mentors, and we are all mentees. I think that, yeah. I think that that is an excellent point. I think, you know, it goes to leading by example. And um, in the LGBTQ sphere, one of the things that everybody on this campus can do is be visible. Um, many times LGBTQ people feel invisible. Um, and so as an ally or as an LGBTQ advocate, you can um, be a part of the Safe Space program, which I know I've seen some of the stickers around, but little things like that, leading by example, uh, you know, saying that, uh, you know, anti-LGBTQ uh, slurs are not uh, not going to be allowed in your house. I think that that is, um, is one of the major ways that everybody, whether you're an administrator, a faculty member, a staff person, um, can be a part of changing the culture on this, this campus so that um, nobody feels invisible and everybody feels uh, included. So our discussion today centers around the collective impact and that includes the partnerships of UCF leadership, faculty, staff, and the Orlando community. Do you feel that UCF is a mirror of the greater Orlando community in terms of diversity and reflects the feeling of being of the community? What do you propose can be done to continue and improve the reflection and interaction? <laughs> That's why I selected the middle. <laughs> You know, I, I really couldn't answer this question, to be honest with you. I've not been, I've only been in the Orlando area for a while. I'm not really that familiar with the school. So for me, maybe the biggest thing is help to educate others in the community who are not directly connected with UCF to figure out and understand what your background is. I found it very fascinating reading the STRAT plan and obviously wanted to become more interested in what that is. But right now, I could not tell you what that is. And so as a member of community, maybe that's why I was saying is you need to be able to reach out and let me know for someone who's passive and not, in, not engaging with the university in any, in any particular way. I have to take my head off in front of President Hitt. I think that he has demonstrated a leadership that is quite unique in terms of moving this institution from where it was to where it is. And I think that for us to have a medical school, that's amazing. For us to be going to downtown, that's incredible. Um, so I, I think that I have to recognize that in terms of the impact that these initiatives will have in the community. However, I wonder if, if that success has to do with the institution, with what we call UCF. But how will it impact directly some communities that are around UCF? Uh, I'm not sure, even though I, I was in a discussion where some leaders of the effort to occur downtown were able to very nicely and clearly articulate how moving to downtown was going to impact the community, the surrounding community. And please excuse me, because I do represent the Hispanic community. I, I don't know how all that has been articulated precisely in terms of the Hispanic community. Um, and it worries me because we know that the future of this nation, it particularly the state of Florida, has to do with people like me. And uh, I don't know 
uh, what that is in terms of the collective impact of all of us members of this community in the Hispanic community. Uh, the tough part of me says that it, it is an afterthought because there aren't people at the highest level that in a conversation will say, oh, oh, wait, espérate, espérate. We have not mentioned the Latinos, Latinas, okay? And, and maybe I'm completely wrong. Maybe when I get to my office today or Monday, I will have a note from someone saying all the facts were wrong. Let me give you the facts. We have done A, B, C, D, E, F, F, one, F2, F3. <laughs> I will love that. I will really search to have that. But if that is happening, I don't know about it. And there are different generations of Hispanics in here. If you go to Kissimmee, many of the younger kids that are Latinos and Latinas will be able to communicate with you in English with no accent, not my accent. They will have no accent because they were born in here. But there is another generation, the generation of the parents. And if you know anything that has to do with the Hispanic culture, you know that the family is very important and that many of the kids are not going to do anything if they don't have the bendición, the blessing of the parents, whoever the parents is at that point meaning that we, this community, must include some of the people that do not speak English at the level of university people. We need people at the university that are familiar with Spanish English, that can communicate all these goals to that other generation, because they are key in the life of UCF and in the life of this effort of the community. And I'm only speaking, up again, about the Hispanic, but I'm sure that there are the Haitians, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, that includes issues of inclusion and diversity. I, I actually think that UCF does a pretty good job of being the partnership university um, and making sure that um, there's a real sense of, uh, of engagement and uh, volunteerism in the community. Um, I mean, just having been a student here, one of the things that I noticed, particularly in a lot of service learning opportunities, is that there was a tendency to stay away from the political. And a lot of the people that these diversity and inclusion initiatives are targeted, for them, for us, um, many times the personal is political, and so we don't have a choice about that. Um, and so, um, you know, if you're somebody who uh, administers or facilitates service learning opportunities, I would say, you know, we have, you know, the, the communities affected by these programs, um, because of that, uh, it's all that much more important that we get people involved in the civic and political sphere in our state. And so I would encourage you to think about um, which opportunities you're presenting to students in terms of civic and political service learning opportunities. I think that would be one way that we could continue to move the ball forward and um, making our state uh, reflect the, the values that we all share here at UCF. Fantastic. We have one more prepared question, and then we will be turning to you, the audience and participants, including our live stream friends, for some great questions. So start thinking about those questions. All right, panelists, so what do you feel are some of the biggest challenges facing UCF and our community today? Can you explain those challenges and give us some examples of solutions you may feel uh, could be implemented to address those changes, those challenges? I would love to know how many UCF students and faculty didn't vote in the last election. Um, you know, one of the biggest existential threats to this university is funding from our state, legislator, like st yeah, state legislature, uh, funding for um, all of the programs uh, at the university, but particularly diversity and inclusion programming. Um, and so, you know, I think um, we have to think about this at the macro level. And if we're not being engaged um, at that level, 
um, you know, this work uh, could be put to, put, it could be stopped by our legislature. Um, and we need to ma be making sure that, uh, you know, those folks hear us and that our voices are being heard. Um, and uh, yeah, I think that that to me is the biggest way we can do that. One, I think that when it comes to students, we have achieved access. As a matter of fact, that's why we are or we will become an HSI. Uh, but I would like to see the figures in terms of retention and more important, graduation. And I don't want to see the figures as Latinos or minorities. I want to see the data disaggregated. And then when we disaggregate the data, I would like to see the different subgroups of Hispanics. Because I think that there are major differences there. And I also think that um, we are not, that, that the graduation rate continues to be a challenge. For, for all minority groups, but again, because I, represent the Latino, Latina constituency. I'm very concerned about that. And I think that if we were to know the figures disaggregated, it will be alarming for some groups. Uh, you know, I told you that I have graduated in my almost 30 years as faculty, graduate faculty, 51 uh, doctors. And many people will say, because I'm Latina, oh, you have graduated so many Latinos, Latinas at the doctor level. You know how many at the doctor level? Who wants to take a guess? Because we're doing very good with access, but I'm saying the problem is with graduation. Of those 51, how many Latinos do you think I have graduated? Anyone? Five, three, one. One Puerto Rican like me in almost 30 years, and that was the other day. So my contribution at the doctor level has not been with my people. I have graduated more than 99% of other populations. And in terms of minority, the significant number has been African American. One Puerto Rican like me three years ago. Okay, that's very telling, and it is very close to my heart. The uh, number two, it will be, what can we do uh, with faculty in terms of biggest uh, challenges? I think that we, different from students that have accomplished access, I think that we still have a long way to go with the hiring of Latino faculty at this university. And then uh, once they're hired, we need to retain them. But more important, they need to achieve tenure and promotion. We can spend a lot of money in hiring Latino faculty, but if they don't make the tenure and promotion ladder, it all has been wasted. And that's a big challenge for this university and I have to say, for a significant number of universities in the nation. For me, I'd say that probably the biggest thing would be building off something you said, Dr. C, is understanding the uh, differences in the diversity area and being able to look at and not go after the bucket. Mm -hmm. But you have to understand who are the people within that bucket and what is the difference um, that they have. Because when it comes to the ind individuals are going to want to look at how am I being treated as I'm defined by myself, as I mentioned earlier, and being able to understand that. So if by going in after the large bucket um, across the board, it, it's, it's going to be an, an issue in the long run because people are not going to be able to self-identify or identify with the institution itself. So really being, uh, being able to understand, and you need the metrics to define that, and you've got need to the numbers. So when you said that, I was like, God, that's right on what I was thinking myself, is the fact of if you're going to make a difference um, and really make a difference that's going to sustain, you've got to understand who the people are, and you have to understand how do I engage them and how do I retain them.
Fantastic. Are there any questions from our participants today? Okay. We have a microphone coming around. Here we go. You know, I, I have to say that if this were my class, you all will be in trouble. <laughs> because I would feel like a teacher up here, like, I must be so boring. <laughs> Never. Look, people are going to sleep. <laughs> they are very quiet. No. And when the classroom is quiet, as a teacher, I become very nervous. Because it means most of the people are someplace, but not with me. <laughs> so let's have, maybe that's my Hispanic thing, maybe let's have a little movement here, yeah. action, okay? Because we have spoken about very serious issues, and those issues must move you. See. Si. <laughs> Thank you, panelists. Thank you for being honest and for bringing us your truth and your perspective, which is important in panels that have significance. So I, I really salute you on that. Um, I have a couple of questions. Michael, you mentioned the person as being political, and I just, I'm in love with you now. <laughs> it, could be, it could be interesting, but no. <laughs> and, and as an advocate for women and girls and people of all uh, disciplines and fields and differences in intersectionalities, I feel that our students never want controversy and our students never want to be political and they never want to take a stand. And it's not like I'm telling them my stand is the best stand that you can take. But I try to educate them. You need to take control of your life, and you need to take control of your destiny and the destiny of your nation. So I am always advocating that involvement, that serious involvement in advocacy that creates change. Do you have any suggestions for me or for us to create that overall citizen that we need? Because after all, this is not going to be my future. This is going to be their future. I'm going to be somewhere in a seed under a tree somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully making people laugh from on the other side. But what do you suggest from the young people that you work with, that you see some of them, can we clone them? What, what have been some of those characteristics that you have seen? And then I have another question. Hmm. That's a tough question uh, because you know, I mean, the reality is if you don't take control of your own life, um, you will be on the menu. Somebody, somebody said that. Uh, and so, um, you know, I think for a lot of people, and I mean, certainly for me, at a, maybe a younger age than many people, I realized um, how it affected my personal life directly. And I think that, that many people maybe haven't reached that point yet. Maybe they are getting health care coverage through the university um, and haven't had to live without that at any particular time. Maybe they lived before we had marriage equality and never had to deal with um, a couple that had been together for 25 years being separated at a hospital at the end of their life or uh, haven't had to live in fear of deportation or something like that. But the reality is that, um, you know, we are all impacted by our political and our civic systems in this country. And if you don't take control over your own political and civic life, you will be on the menu at some point. And so maybe we need to do a better job of communicating to people how important it is. And it may not be uh, just because it's not impacting you at that particular moment doesn't mean that it won't in your future. And we also have, outside of that, we have a commitment to be a citizen of this community um, and, and care for one another. And we should be thinking about how our lack of actions impacts the lives of the people around us. And my second question could be for anyone, but you know, I'm looking at Rosa, and you know I love you so much. <laughs> You're saying so many things, and I'm going like, yes, right? <laughs> well, try not to make noise. <laughs> how do we keep our energy level? How do we keep being positive? How do we keep giving inspiration to others when sometimes it's not given to us? When sometimes the days are very long and the weeks are endless, and it's a little bit of the same soup, one more time, re reheated and <laughs> or refried, um, re-microwaved. How, how do we keep that 
that that has made us into leaders, that, had, that has made us into other people looking at us for uh, inspiration, to continue that flame, to have that intensity. That's a good question. And from my perspective, is, is connecting in with people who have the passion that you're trying to connect with. Um, I, in my role in DNI, I've had a hard year around keeping engaged because we're not making the progress we need to make. Um, it's not advancing as fast as I think it should. And if I just stay in the day and day grind of trying to produce the results I'm supposed to, because it's part of my job, it's not everything that I do, um, it becomes, I become ineffective at what I'm trying to drive. So I need to com connect back with parts of um, the DNI community and other areas or, or uh, aspects of the community to get energized from. So you have to start to figure out who are those people, th that network that you can build, that can keep you, um, serve as that part where you go in and you can get re-energized, you can get refocused, you can figure out um, why you're, you know, moving away from it or you're not focused on it. For me, that's what you need to figure out is to, to look at how can I make the connection with someone else, maybe someone in the university, maybe an external organization, whatever that may be. But to recognize it and do something about it is probably the first step and then find out who that is and build a regular network that you can connect with. Because it is easy to get distracted from that. It is easy to get defeated that you don't think you're making the, the way that you, that you want to. But you also have to realize, in my mind, um, and a big part of what my mission in life has been, is helping others. And I'm not doing that if I become disengaged, if I slow down. If I get disheartened, it's not me who's just impacted. It's everyone else I'm trying to help along the way and be a part of and influence. Other questions? I remember very well the first time that I was uh, having a conversation like this, and it was in the fall of 1977. And at that point, it was not called diversity. It was called cultural differences. So since 1977, I've been a participant of uh, debates, arguments, discussion chats like this. And if you are in uh, the work that, that we seem to be interested in, you know that it is exhausting, especially if there are not too many of you carrying the flag, and that carrying the flag sometimes can have not very pretty consequences. And I have to tell you, many times when I come to campus and I am exhausted, and I have conflicting feelings of anger, sadness. Yes, I'm going to go out there. I pretend. That's what I do. I pretend that everything is fine and dandy and that I have all this energy and that I am OK. Because what else is it for me to do? To collapse in front of the fountain? I just pretend, and I ask for the Lord to give me energy for that day to be a source of inspiration and to have clarity of mind. But when I get home, I collapse. And the only person that will know how deeply depressed I am is my husband. No one else. Because I cannot show all those feelings where I work. Because you know, that's called lack of professionalism. If I were to show how depressed I am, how sad, how frustrated, how angry I am that I did this talk in 1977 and today, 2017, I'm doing the same talk, I will go crazy, and they will put me, I don't know, where? But I, will, I know that that's not professional behavior. So, since I learned that, 
and I am a faculty and I represent this prestigious institution, I pretend and I'm good at it. I'm masterful and I look very professional like most of the people that do this type of work. And every time that one of us deviate and start showing what is really going on, we marginalize that person. And I have seen so many people marginalized and suffer the consequences. I don't want, I don't want that to happen to me. I have a stellar career. I have received, in a humble way, many awards. I was born for one purpose, to teach. And I am so lucky that early on, I found that purpose. But gee, wow, only my poor husband, I should give him all my awards. <laughs> because he knows what it is at the end of the day. So first and foremost, Dr. C, I do want to say Arturo Peto. I did not say that earlier. You can ask me later what that means. I learned a little bit in her class. So I know earlier we spoke about this revolving door that we've had here at UCF from folks from these underrepresented groups that were in the professional ranks, in the faculty ranks. I'd like to know a strategy that you think UCF can implement from each one of you, a strategy that we can implement to close that door. Well, I mean, I think it, I guess it depends on what you think causes that. Um, I mean, the, what I would imagine causes it and what I hear from business leaders and educational leaders is that um, the brain drain that we quite frequently experience in Florida is because we don't have a welcoming and inclusive civic and political sphere here. You know, we can do all of this work on campus, but when people leave, um, if they're being discriminated against or if they're experiencing uh, microaggressions or aggressions that uh, don't make them feel welcome in the community, they're not going to stay. They're going to look for, for ways to move to Boston or to Los Angeles, and they're going to they're gonna move on from our community. Um, so I think that we have to do a better job of um, being engaged in that and changing the culture and the civic sphere in Florida so that hopefully people will choose to make this their permanent home and that we won't end up with such a revolving door type situation that we hear so much about. You know, Andrea, we have people <coughs> at every university that are paid good salaries to answer that, because I'm a faculty. <laughs> I'm not a policymaker, okay? Now, if I were to use my own case, when I was an assistant professor and I was on the tenure track, which should be, as I said, one of the concerns is not only hiring, but tenure and promotion, successful tenure and promotion, the one thing that helped me was that there were two senior faculty members, not my mentors, these were like two members of my department, that took a special interest in my success. In what way, if they received an invitation to write a chapter, to write an article, those two were knocking at my door saying, Rosa, come and write this with us. If those two, Connie Dillon and Dr. Weber, had not invited me to be a co-author with them, I would not have successfully been promoted to associate. I know that. And it cannot be through this structure mentoring program. The senior faculty must take special interest meaning publishing with the assistant professors. Because that's what is going to count, is publishing, is nothing else. I have to agree, it's, it's not the policy or legislation, it's the relationship. It's having that access to the relationship to people who can provide opportunity um, and introductions to networks. And be able to, that's, that's how I made it. I mean, one of the first lessons I learned in corporate America was, because uh, I'm highly introverted, 
afraid of people knowing I'm gay. I'm back in that. And they're like, you're phenomenal at your job. You understand it. You, sh you would be successful anywhere, but no one knows who you are. And so I was peered, I was peered with someone who, could, uh, who knew nothing about the work, but who knew everybody in the world. And that's where I started to get successful. So it's who you have access to and providing that and making those connections. Um, and it's not something that can really be forced through policy legislation, programs, mentoring. I've been through many corporations. It just does not work. You have to have um, a faculty or a leadership or, or that embraces the um, aspect of their job is developing other people. That has to be a component, and through that, they create mentorships, sponsorships, and those types of um, activities that provide access to people to whatever it is. In your world, it's getting published. In my world, it's making a sale and, and making it happen. And people don't aren't successful in our sales and marketing worlds until they actually um, learn the process, but they have to understand and be mentored through it because it's all about interacting with people. So it's the relationships that, that need to occur. Fantastic. We have time for one more question. One more question. I see a hand over here. Thank you so much for sharing with us today. Um, we all know the phrase, readers are leaders, and leaders are readers. And I was wondering if you would each share a favorite book you've either read recently or that you go to a lot uh, to help you in the, the leadership area. Thank you. Well, they're saying here this is a difficult question, and I can understand why it is difficult for you guys and not that difficult for me. <laughs> because I am paid to read. I'm paid to read and write. What a pleasure. So one book that I, uh, or two books, let me just stop at two, that uh, are not directly dealing with leadership. As a matter of fact, they don't have leadership in uh, the leadership word in the title. The one is The Power of Habit. And we all should read that book because it tells us that many times what we have become is just a big habit. And we are in this vicious circle. And then how to get out of that? And the other book is called Collaboration. And that book really fascinates me because it says that it is erroneous and even a myth to think that collaboration is always good. And it proposes that many times the best thing that we can do is not to collaborate. Because bad collaboration is the worst thing can happen to an organization. So those two, the power of habit and then collaboration. Uh, I'm going to pull Sarah Palin and I'm going to pass. Uh, I do read, but. Uh, uh, I'm going to leave it to the, the academics uh, to, to answer those <laughs> questions for you. But, um, and particularly, I, I can't think of a lot of leadership books that I've read that might be applicable to your, your question. But, um, so I'll pass it to Brian if, if you have one. <laughs> and, uh, excuse me, I don't mean to say that you don't read. I know how I'm to sure read. that you read a lot. But there, I guess the question, uh, at least for me, sounded ac an academic Oh, type yeah, of, of question. I'm, I'm uh, totally going down that path. Yeah. So as I'm looking through my book selection here, <laughs> uh, the, the, actually the first one that came up is, that is, the, is the power of habit. Um, so I won't go there. Um, for me, I, I, I read books all the time because I'm part of the, the learning and development world, so I need to understand where we're at. And what I will say is when I talk to people about reading what books to read is, is looking at finding out um, I'm not sure it's important for one book. There's not the one book. I think the thing is, is finding the books that's out there in the, in the subject you're looking for, leadership being one, and figuring out what you identify with and what really resonates with you and making it move forward. 
Um, for me, it's I, I, a lot of leadership books. Eckhart Tolle and the Power of Now is one for, that I that I've liked. But for me, when he comes down to it, I always talk about find the book. I have this thing: read the fir read the first chapter, read the last chapter, and then figure out if it's resonating with you. If you want to delve into the rest of the book and move forward and really look at what, uh, explore it and see how you self-identify with it and how you can apply it to your world. Because in some cases, you need to put the book down and come back a year or two later and pick it up and start to see, am I ready to hear what's going to be held in this book and understand it? Clarification. <laughs> to all my students here, especially uh, all of you down there, this thing about the first chapter and the last chapter is for everyone but you. Fantastic. Well, thank you very much. Uh, it was an honor this morning to hear from our excellent panel. Your perspectives and wisdom have been really helpful to us, and, and we appreciate you being here and being a part of this great conversation. And I will turn it over to Shamika and Sylvia for a more formal thank you. That was an incredible discussion. And um, I'd like to say something to Dr. Citron. Citron. I, um, I don't think that you have been speaking since 1977 in vain. And um, I say that because I'm a Cuban. My parents are Cuban refugees. And I'm a poster child, basically, for the diversity and inclusion programs. So even if in your world you don't see it, you are part of a movement that is having a big effect. So on behalf of myself, um, I'd like to thank you. Um, so uh, Shamika's here, and um, she's going to give you all some gifts. I also I have one more thing, actually. I'm, I'm Latin and a little scatterbrained myself. Um, I uh, wanted to ask Mr. Gray, um, it's kind of pointing on one thing that you brought up. Uh, being a Hispanic serving institution does give us access to money, but we have to apply for that money. We have to show that we are making progress towards meeting these goals, okay? And it's actually, uh, on the legislative side, about maybe 10%. I would say that we get 90% of that has to come from our own efforts. Um, part of our metrics is showing that we are improving the workforce, the diversity and inclusion workforce. So from a community standpoint, our graduates, what can we, because a lot of us are here because we want better jobs. You know, we are, I'm, I'm here because I'm at a fork in my career, but there are a lot of people that want, that attend these seminars because we want to take back skills so we can advance our careers and, and earn more money and get better positions. So UCF is, is graduating diversity. It's graduating graduates. What can we do to entice companies to hire UCF grad, the diverse UCF graduates? What do you see in your particular field that would make them have an advantage or that would give them something to <laughs> get them in the door. Is it on? Okay, now it's on. Uh, it's a tough question because uh, we've had this discussion in our own company recently around how do we get in front of um, diverse universities and be competitive um, in um, th the business place? Because we perceive it as being there's so much competition out there. How do we get the students we want to get mm -hmm. as they're being ready? Because we're sitting down and we're looking at um, uh, what is our competition in the area? Uh, 
So I think it's interesting. I, I couldn't. I, I, it's hard for me to determine on that aspect to be to realize. I, in in our market, we're a hospitality-driven organization. Um, and well, Central Florida, for the most part, is hospitality-driven. And so part of the the issue you have is, I think, for us, is educating people on that as an organization. We hire people other than just hotel checking in and housekeeping. Uh, we hire professionals at all levels of the organization. So part of it may be looking at UCF, helping educate the business community and what you're graduating um, and the different programs that you have. Um, <laughs> there's something about being just known as the back, you know, the next door university. They may not have educated or understand how far you've gone and getting from executive leaders in that. It's a, it's a difficult because we see it, I see it from the other side where we're competing for those students and we're looking at how do we get the, the right students and you're looking to figure out how do you get in the track to us. Um, so maybe there's an opportunity for the business community and UCF to come together to tackle both problems together to come up with a solution. Well, that was the initial idea behind collective, you know, one community collective impact. That's why we invited community members like you so that we could find out these, these, these um, answers to these questions. So um, I'm going to turn it over to Shamika. I probably used up too much time. Here we go. <laughs> Thank you very much for your, um, for your thing. Yep. We're going to start the next activity. If you guys can join me just one more time in thanking our panelists. And we are going to have them actually join you all for our last portion of our program, our discussion section. So now it's your turn to join our conversation by discussing how you will join the UCF community to make a collective impact. So I would like our LEP mentors, our supervisor, my fellow cohort members to join your tables as we go through these, the small group discussion. And we will answer the following questions. How does scale times excellence equal impact resonate with you and your role? Why is it important for UCF and the Orlando community to partner together, especially surrounding conversations on access and inclusion? How will you incorporate the concept of one community collective impact into your work and to bring it back around to our chain activity, what new elements can you add to your chain of impact? So join in discussion, and we will come around and hear some excellent answers.
And that's part of it, because, you know, so we do um, work with um, hospitality, Burlington and Hospitality School, and there's an industry board, it's like an education and an industry board that we all sit on, and we're in there, we're helping people oh. with understanding what we're looking for, educating, and, and I know the other hotel groups are involved in the hospitality side, so I don't know, I, maybe because that's such a niche area, where, I don't know how, this is my ignorance around the programs and the, the areas that you all focus in on, is how do you map or figure out what are the businesses or organizations I should be coming in and utilizing as a, um, a reference point to provide the data and the information mm -hmm. that I need to help prepare my people throughout. I know that there is a disconnect mm -hmm. because in many areas I know that the number of doctors that we are graduating will not become faculty members mm -hmm. because the market has in English is already saturated. saturated. So we have been hearing that we should in our classroom be giving these doctoral students skills, not for the academy, for other jobs. Mm -hmm. But we don't know what that is because we have been in this little world <coughs> forever. Mm -hmm. So why shouldn't one of my doctoral students be able to work for a hotel? But I don't know what that is. And, it, and it's interesting because, so in my world, uh, with focus more on the from education would be people coming out of it from an organizational um, psychology. I see people graduating from um, UCF and mm -hmm. other areas and coming with these these huge um, undergraduate and master's degrees and all of that, and they're moving in, and it's like there's no entry level into an organization with someone, especially at the master, where mm -hmm. the master's level to come in where they would slot because they don't have the experience. And, look, and I had this one great candidate who um, I've worked with in some different organization, and, and he, he came to me and was talking about it, and I'm like, he's worked all his time, he's worked in retail, he's managed a store, and now you want to move into a corporate America job at this, and I, it's about how do you, how do you step back into an organization to get the balance between experience and knowledge, and, and realize and understand, you're going to have more, no, more knowledge an understanding of the science behind and organizational the psychology practice. than I do, but you don't have the practice. Mm -hmm. And I think where businesses are looking at where, where it has an opportunity is you have people like me who are at that, that the end quote of their career, if you will, and we're in this massive amount of this, this uh, um, generation that we're in, generational mm -hmm. X's, yeah, yeah. and we're going to have people that are highly educated but no practical experience, so there's got to be a way to, for us to start to bridge the gap, and maybe it's programs internships. to internships and other things that we have where we can work around, because the example the gentleman I gave, he, said, he has to make a, li make a living. Exactly. He is his sole supporter. Mm -hmm. So but how do you do that? There's a way to figure it out and saying, yeah, he's in retail, he's a manager, he can work, he can mess with his hours. I can give him four hours three times a week to come on in and, and get practical experience. Those are the types of, I think, partnerships, university and businesses we need to look at. And it's about what are our long-term missions and what do we have to solve for? Because I think in both sides, as the example we kind of talked about, we can both, both have different problems with the same solution. But we have to come together to figure out what it is. I tell my doctoral students, listen, you're going to have a doctoral degree in no time. Because the academy is saturated. And you have not done anything else. You have not prepared yourself for other things at home. You have to get a job or you have to do that. And then, if I say, what do you do in internship? Well, they have experience. Yeah. And they cannot think that if they were making, let's say, 60000 with a master's, now with a doctorate, they're going to make 40. They are really, like, they cannot continue to maintain the level of lifestyle. It's true. We have someone we just lost at our company who came in and within, she was with us for, I think, two years. She came 
in and within a month or two completely back in. She was ready to move. And she came in at a director level. But the acceleration that you're looking for, because I've now achieved yeah. this, yeah. isn't there because and so she's had to move to another company. Mm -hmm. Same level, she's still fight she's still fighting the challenge that she has to understand she's gonna have to do her time so that her experience and her education and all that kind of levels Level and complement each other is not perceived as being heavy in one way or another. Yeah, it's very complicated. Because we're on the same side. We have people, especially in our in our company, you know, one of the battles we fought and we're looking and we're we're trying to find people with education is that our world actually at one point, um, I had a, a boss that I worked for who was told to stop talking about her education and stop and she was too tolerant. Um, and so you need to, you need to, um, so I'm now, it's, it's interesting, so you look at my resume, which is my professional one, and it's not the one we should have used. I don't mention my education, because it was not something I were, we were allowed to do. Um, and so, but that's flipped. I now have, a, I'm going to have a new CEO that has an education, my other one didn't, you know. So we have to flip it behind and say, how do we help um, provide and educate people? Because I also think there's a worker base now that, um, needs education, mm -hmm. and, I, and I honestly, and I have gone through online programs myself, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but I also think there's a lack of engagement in the education process when you go online, which you don't get, because you don't oh. have those sidebar yeah, conversations, right. and you don't get to find that person I can connect Not with. Not with the teachers and or your peers, no. you know? You don't. Yeah. Okay. Thank yes, thank you. All right, everyone, I hear a lot of chatter, which means that we have a lot of good stuff going on that we would like to share with the room. So if we can have an individual from each table just to be a representative, so choose your person. So when I choose you, it's going to happen. All right, so for question number one, we have how does you all, you all are just having too much fun with this discussions. So this table right here is having a lot of fun, so we're going to select them first. Where's my wonderful mic people? Right there, right there. Yes. So your representative, you're going to answer question number one, which is how does scale times excellence equal impact resonate with you and your role? All right. So it's working. Um, so we had a pretty interesting conversation about, I think there was some confusion about, well, what the heck does that even mean? And I've had the opportunity to be a part of some of those discussions around the strategic plan, and we talked about the idea that UCF is in the impact business. Uh, we're here to make a better future. That's a very noble uh, uh, goal and mission, and that we do it through two different ways, through our size, uh, uh, and that allows us so many other things. We reach a lot of people. We're able to impact a lot of people. Our, our you know, faculty can ha be in a department that has a lot of depth to it and can address you know, big societal issues, but that in and of itself is insufficient if it's not done at a certain standard of, of excellence. Um, so that's kind of where our conversation kind of revolved around, and you know, folks talked about kind of in their areas kind of thinking about, well, how does that work? And you know, even talking about in your, in your personal life and, and kind of that idea of having an impact um, even informed some people's approach to life to think that, yeah, I am here to kind of, you know, make the world a better place. And that's a, that's a great thing. Thank you. All right. Now we are going to go to Miss Bonnie Blue's table over there. So you are go your table is going to answer question number two, which is why is it important for UCF and in the Orlando community to partner together, especially surrounding conversations on access and, and inclusion. Stephanie Campbell, you can answer the question. Um, 
Um, I think it's important for the UCF and Orlando community to partner together, especially surrounding conversations of access and inclusion. I would go back to um, like the downtown campus and like being very aware of um, the community that we are supporting. And then also given that like we want to recruit um, students and faculty and staff and administrators and then being aware of what their needs are so that we retain them and then also being very visible not just in the sense of like UCF being popular but in a sense of being very engaged and active in the community. Thank you very much. And we have time to answer one last uh, of the questions. And I'm going to go to my mentor's table, Mr. John Pittman. And we are going to do question number three, which is how will you incorporate the concept of one community collective impact into your work? Yeah, our table officially didn't get to question number three. <laughs> <laughs> However, um, if I had to answer that question, I would start with saying, one, I would look at my own view of UCF, my role at UCF, and my view of the community. You know, UCF, basically, we did talk about we exist because of the community. You know, we're here to educate, research, and serve the community. We're producing graduates. When they leave, they're going to be going into a community somewhere in this world. We're doing research, and the research is here to help solve the problems of the community. So really, we are one already, but we need to view ourselves as that. Once we begin to change our own individual views, then we can have a greater impact in the community. Thank you. So I want to thank everyone for participating in our group reflection on today's event. It is our hope that you have now gained some tangible and measurable steps that will guide you towards impacting our university and our community. Now to Ms. Rhonda and Elenia, who will be doing the next portion of our program. Hello, how is everybody? Still awake? Yay! We're giving away stuff. So our first giveaway is actually from the UCF bookstore, uh, who was one of our sponsors. And we have 20 wa uh, water bottles here for you guys. And I'm going to read the last three numbers of the ticket. And you can come up and get your water bottle. So we have the first one is 573. 573. Yay! I'm going to keep going, you know. Uh, the next one is 500. Yay! <laughs> so you, now you have a fancy water bottle. Next one, 536. Five, three, six. Next one is five, zero, four. Five, zero, four. Five, forty, six. Five, forty, six. No, 546 going once. No. Next one. 585. 585. 585. Okay, next one. 580. 580. They must have left. <laughs> next one. 561. 561. 583, 583, yay! <laughs> I was starting to get discouraged. We want to give away stuff. Next one, 570, 570. 555, 555, yay! 
577. 577. No, no. Okay. 571. 571. She, she's like, yay, it's me. <laughs> All right. Uh, 559, 559. Yay. 578. Oh, yeah. Seems to be like a lucky table back in there. Okay, 528, 528, yay. I'll shake it up, I'll shake it up, just make sure, you know, I'm not hitting the same table. 8538, sorry, 538, <laughs> I, started, I started confusing you, I'm sorry, 538, no, yay. Four ninety five. <laughs> Yay. Four ninety five. Four ninety two. These are the people that got here really early. Four ninety two. Anybody? No. Five thirty. Five thirty. No. 587. Somebody over there in the corner. 543. 543. Yay! My former colleague. Yay! <laughs> um, 560. 560. No? 547. Five sixty five. No. Five twenty three. Where did everybody go? There's still snacks, you know. Five sixty eight. Five sixty eight. Yay. Five sixty nine. No. Five sixty nine. Five fifty seven. Yeah. Stephanie got it. Five thirty two. Yay. That's it. That's it. No more. So that is it for our uh, water bottles from the UCF bookstore. We are very grateful to Steve, the manager, for those. And now we have uh, two more giveaways, which are from Ten Penny Chiropractor. Uh, so we have um, a massage that's an hour massage, and then we also have acupuncture. So I'm going to give away the acupuncture first. This is with Dr. Carla Barbera. So you, ha you can do acu acupuncture or uh, what's called cupping therapy. So it's 494. 494. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> Sorry. And then this is again uh, Dr. Tenpenny, who's my doctor. He's amazing. Uh, one hour massage with my massage therapist, Jahaida. And the number is 490. 490. So we would like to uh, congratulate all you winners uh, and thank again our sponsors. Uh, our sponsors are UCF Alumni, uh, UCF Communications and Marketing, 
uh, the Office of Diversity and Inclusion, Office of Student Involvement, uh, the UCF School of Visual Arts and Design, where I'm from, yay, uh, the UCF Bookstore, and then our other sponsors are Aramark, uh, who gave us our food. Uh, please feel free to get some fruit on your way out. Take it to your colleagues that haven't had any fruit today. Uh, Publix, uh, Dr. Tenpenny and uh, his uh, office, and Walmart. So thank you again. And I will leave you with Jacob uh, for some closing remarks, and thank you for coming. All right, if I could have all of the LEP class join me up front. Might get a little crowded if we're all up here. Either way. I feel like I missed a black and gold memo. Look at this. <laughs> <laughs> All right. It has been my pleasure to be involved and engaged in this program with an awesome group of folks. Uh, we really could not have uh, done what we've done this year without, without this group. And so I'm very thankful to, uh, to be a member of this program and, and be able to work, learn, and engage with some excellent folks. So uh, just thank you very much. Uh, to my LEP class for all that you've done to put this event together. Uh, we're also very thankful for our mentors uh, who've provided countless hours of support and guidance to us on our poster projects, which please take a look at those on your way out. Uh, and of course, uh, on our own professional journeys here at UCF and beyond. Um, thank you again to our supervisors and to our departments who have allowed us to uh, invest in our professional development and spend some great time interacting with our colleagues. Uh, we're incredibly thankful to ODI and all of their hard work, uh, including the staff there, Karen, Barb, Katie, Stephanie, Rachel, and Susan. Uh, and of course, thank you to uh, UCF uh, alumni for letting us use their space today, and Rachel and her team for helping us uh, get, getting everything set up. Um, also, thank you to the UCF administration and leadership for all of their hard work uh, in the creation of this collective impact strategic plan um, and for really moving us forward to that UCF 3.0 that we know that we can be uh, to serve the UCF community. Uh, also, thank you to some volunteers. Shout out to uh, OSI and our marketing folks for helping us live stream uh, the event and, and engage uh, in everything that way as well. So thank you all attendees for coming today and joining us for some great conversation. Hopefully, uh, you have some very tangible takeaways and ways that you can impact the community uh, both through your role and on uh, a local level, but also uh, the greater UCF community and the greater Central Florida community. Uh, I think we've heard a lot of great things for our keynote and from our panelists today about ways that we can engage uh, in the discourse and in the dialogue to improve our society and improve our uh, community. And I just challenge all of you to, uh, to be involved in that way and engage in that way. Thank you very much for attending, and I think we're going to take some photos. Oh, two other announcements. I'm sorry, two other announcements. Um, one, there are some really cool ceramic coasters on your table. Please take that with you to be reminded of the collective impact. And we will be sending out a, an assessment via email in the, the coming days. So just be on the lookout for that. Uh, and please fill, a, fill that out and let us know how we did. Thank you very much.